Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Queen's Tech Council webinar on independent venture capital. My name is Neil Wagner from the Queen's Chamber of Commerce and the Queen's Tech Council Policy Committee. The Queen's Tech Council is a Queen's Chamber initiative to bring stakeholders together to develop and foster a pro-tech ecosystem here in Queen's. And one way we do that is by hosting webinars like this. The goal of today's webinar is to provide attendees with a general overview of specialized and independent venture capital firms, how they operate, what role they play in the larger startup and venture capital ecosystem, how they differ from other investment vehicles, and the pros and cons of working with one. The discussion will also explore the investment process, how companies are discovered and selected, what a founder can expect during the pitch and negotiation process, and how to gauge if there's a good fit between a founder and a firm. Joining us today are two members of the Queen's Tech Council, Mitchell Hauser and Bill Staniford. Mitchell and Bill, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. All right, um, so Bill, starting with you, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and um, how you fit into the space in uh, independent venture capital? Sure. Um, uh, so first of all, again, thank you. Thank you for having me. I am a uh, born and raised New Yorker. I'm a former United States Marine Corps cryptologist and code breaker. I've been a serial entrepreneur since approximately uh, 2002. I am the former CEO of Property Shark, which was one of the original prop tech companies um, based out of, of, of Brooklyn. I am the former CEO of a company called Urbant, which was a second generation data aggregation platform. We did a pretty sophisticated machine learning artificial intelligence project with Con Edison. Um, I have deep knowledge within the, the prop tech and smart city space. And I, I'm, I'm somewhat different. I, I'm certainly not a, a formal VC in any way, shape or form. I am an advisor for early stage companies. I advise multiple companies within that space. I guide people through uh, concept stages to get their first funding. Um, and uh, so, you know, any companies that are looking to, to get on the path of becoming a VC fundable company, um, that's really my area of expertise. Fantastic. Uh, Mitchell, how about you? Hi. Yeah, so I am a what I what I call as a venture advisor. I do something similar to what Bill does. I work with early stage companies to help prepare position uh, to go re with a finance strategy and then go execute, which for early stage companies almost always means raising capital. Um, my model is through strategic ventures as my company is that we uh, we take most of our compensation in equity. We become shareholders of the company. And so our interests align with uh, the entrepreneur. Uh, typically, we only work with uh, companies that are uh, have a social impact. Uh, only companies that have a social benefit are mission oriented. We only work with companies that are validated in terms of intellectual property and with revenue. And we obviously have to believe strongly in the investment thesis. Um, what I'd like to point out is that finance strategy for early stage companies typically encompasses everything that they do. And the reason for that is uh, even questions about uh, marketing plans, business model, uh, go-to-market strategy, uh, hiring plans, all these sit underneath the finance strategy for earlier stage companies. Uh, my background is 10 years on Wall Street as a buy side analyst and portfolio manager at hedge funds and mutual funds uh, at a private equity group uh, after that. And then I started a company called uh, Maritel, which provided ship to shore wireless telephony. Uh, and after I completed that, uh, I've worked uh, after that experience, I've only worked with earlier stage companies because I find working with entrepreneurs. Uh, so exciting and educational. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, that last piece kind of leads into my second question. Um, what are some of the things that get you guys the most excited about what you do? Um, Bill, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, so again, I mean, most of my area of expertise lies within the prop tech and smart city space. And, and I believe, I mean, this area is the most important to me because Real estate impacts everybody's life, and um, there there are so many different facets of it. It really runs the gamut from your your single family residential all the way to um, you know 
office space, midtown Manhattan. And everybody in one way, shape or form is, is interfacing with, with real estate. Um, and there's so many solutions that can be created that actually create a better environment um, for us in which to live. And, and it, it runs really anywhere from, obviously there's a lot of um, uh, monies that are involved in, in profit for the developer, but you know, I've been intimately involved with, with a project that was working with local utilities. And the premise was that we can, through data, identify specific attributes of buildings that make buildings less energy efficient. And so these types of things are, are somewhat mind blowing where, you know, when people think of um, the, the environment and, and greenhouse emissions, most people or a lot of people think of cars, but really most of the energy that's lost is through, through buildings. And if we can use data in a way that can streamline the process of retrofitting buildings, we, we stand to save billions of dollars, which is literally coming down the pipe right now. And uh, you know it, these things are incredibly impactful for the world in which we live. And that's absolutely what gets me up every day. That's awesome. Um, Mitchell, anything else that excites you about the space? So uh, as I said, what really excites me is the fact that every time I work with an entrepreneur, I'm learning something because they're, uh, and particularly for the areas that I work in, which are impact companies. So there's a lot of technology behind what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, I get the benefit of working with lots of people who are PhDs and uh, very often I feel like the, the least smart person in the room. Uh, I feel like I'm just picking up through osmosis what others have already uh, figured out. What's also extremely exciting is to be part of something, that's something that is successful. Um, specifically, I'm just a part of the, you know, just a piece of what these, you know, part, the piece that, that will help them achieve their vision. I mean, without capital, without a, a finance strategy, they won't be able to bring this to market uh, or really extend, expand into the market. They won't be able to be successful. And to know that I've been able to be an integral part of that is uh, really rewarding to me. Uh, as I said, all the companies I work with are have a social benefit. So that also uh, furthers my, uh, you know, the psychic pleasure that you get out, get from that. Uh, I find also the process. Um, also interesting, it's collaborative. Uh, I'm doing something that most companies don't understand or they don't have time to do. So, and I have a team of people who work with me. So when we come in, uh, typically this is an important milestone for them as well because we're also doing our due diligence and evaluating the management team, evaluating the business model, the opportunity for success. And then also, and I guess lastly, what's exciting is that when we're connecting them with the right kind of investors, which are usually institutional investors, uh, there's also uh, that satisfaction of knowing that we're helping them meet their mandate as well. Fantastic. Um, you've both kind of touched on that some of the, your work involves, you know, guiding people through concept set, concept steps to get them ready uh, or to get them VC ready. Um, can you guys just tell us what are some like super high level things that a company or a founder can do to, to make themselves stand out from everybody else? Yeah, listen, I'll, I'll take a first shot at this. I mean, um, I, I think that having a very clear mission um, of what you're trying to accomplish is incredibly important and making sure that you have a, a great business model that makes sense. Um, those things, are, those things are, are really critical. But these days, I think the majority um, falls on the team and the team has to be agile, creative, intelligent, flexible, motivated. And I, I think the, the first step is to make sure that you truly understand yourself as an entrepreneur. And I, I really can't stress that enough. Understanding what your weaknesses and strengths are and understanding what you're about to embark on. Um, I, I am a serial entrepreneur. I have been through the trenches. I have bootstrap companies. I've raised series um, seed, pre-seed, A. I, I've done it all. 
Um, and it's brutal. It, it, takes a, it takes a certain level of determination and um, you know, grit to make it happen. And so really understanding what you're good at, uh, I can't stress that enough. And, and, and understanding your weaknesses and being open and honest about your weaknesses and taking action to identify other people within your universe that can help you and, um, and strengthen the areas in which you're weak. So when I'm, looking at, when I'm looking at a company, of course, I wanna make sure initially whether it's operating in an area that has good potential um, for profitability that, and, and that's very important because I'm never going to ask a, a VC to even engage with a company that I don't see the financial benefit of, right? So that, that's obviously critical. But ultimately, what ends the what what wins the day, what what closes the deal is team, um, team and team. Uh, awesome. I, I like what you said, Bill. I I I, I, got, I sign me up. Um, I would, you know, for, for my part, I, I don't work. I have to say that I don't work with companies that are just a concept. I only work with companies that are that are validated, uh, meaning. Uh, there has to be very significant intellectual property behind it or, and or uh, revenue. I like to know that people want to buy the, their service or their product. Uh, there does need to be a lot of revenue. Doesn't even, uh, even actually just customers, even if they're just using it. So I want to be able to you know, call customers and do you like this product? Are you happy with the company? Do you like their service? Uh, the other side of that is intellectual property. Uh, for example, I'm working with one company it's four PhDs. They have no product in the market. Uh, they're, they have a way of uh, harvesting the power from near ultraviolet light uh, through a window. Uh, this is extremely exciting. You can then think of all the different ways this could be used and um, how impactful it can be. Um, no product, no revenue, but I'm confident that people would use it if they had it, had it available to them. And the team, this is all out of Princeton University, lots of intellectual property, patents, um, so I, I guess what I'm helping them do is to create a path towards being able to raise capital um, and how to present themselves in a way that uh, uh, their target audience, their potential investors find that compelling and uh, help them get to the finish line. The people we're introducing them to are typically institutional investors, so they see lots of opportunities and we have to help them uh, rise to the top of the email pile, uh, help them stand out and present the, the investment opportunity in a way that uh, uh, causes, you know, causes a call to action. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll just jump back in and I, I'm gonna use the specific example of a company, which is one of my favorites that I was working with fairly recently um, called Realty Crunch. And this is a company that was not at revenue. Um, they didn't really have a good direct, they didn't have a good business plan. But the team was so strong and so compelling and, and the lead developer was so amazing that I said, listen, I, I know that there's something here. I just don't know what it is. And um, so we were working, trying to deliver tools to the real estate, in, the real estate industry, specifically focused on, on uh, residential brokers and agents, which is a very difficult industry to penetrate. Um, and, you know, COVID broke. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the team just in, in the in the face of adversity, um, the team really rallied, came together, developed some some really interesting products to to help agents deal with COVID, and ultimately the company was purchased by a publicly traded company called Real. This all happened within one year and a half, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Hmm. And you did it all remotely. Probably right. Absolutely, absolutely. But it, a lot of it was a lot of a lot of footwork. A lot of introductions were made to the right people to get adoption of the of the platform and drive usage to show that it was um, a useful product even before revenue was there. So it was it was really creative, scrappy entrepreneurship with determination. It was. So it was I, a I lot have to ask you: Did they have a did they have a figment of what they wanted to do before they met you, or you just knew that this was a really great team? It was so a great I team, take the and, team and they, wrap they, around, uh, wrap the team around uh, an idea. 
Yeah, so it was a great team that really understood the space, that intimately understood real estate. So it was a team that intimately understood real estate as well as technology. And I, I just knew we were going to find solutions that were going to be impactful. And it's, it's very rare, again. Um, but give me the right team and I can make it happen. Mm -hmm. How did you know whom to, uh, were, were, were you on the radar for people to acquire the company so quickly? Uh, that, that was just a uh, hard work, just going around and talking to everybody and, and making mm -hmm. sure that we knew who the players were and who had, uh, who were writing checks to acquire new technologies. That's great. Fantastic. So, um, <clears throat> let's see here when a company or somebody is trying to come and work with you guys, how does that work? Do they find you? Are you always looking for them? And how does that whole process work? So for me, it's, it's really easy. I mean, I, I am, I am easy to find. Um, most people contact me through, through LinkedIn. They say they saw me speaking at some place somewhere or, or whatever. And, um, you know, they send me a note and, and that's it. If uh, I, I'm always happy to get on the phone with an entrepreneur and immediately I just say to them, listen, elevator pitch, just get right <laughs> to it. You know, you can, you can introduce yourself. That's fine. You know, take take two minutes with that, but just give me the elevator pitch. What the hell are we talking about? And mostly, I'm just trying to determine whether or not the person is sane or crazy. Um, and and so, well, well a lot person, of crazy people have done really well. So, you know, so which right, ones are you but, looking but, you for? Know, the crazy ones or sane ones? So so for me, for me, there there is a rule that I abide by, which is the life is too short rule. And so, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I get on the phone with someone that's too aggressive. Um, someone that is that doesn't seem to know the industry well, that doesn't have a good grasp of what they're trying to accomplish. I'll pretty much end the conversation quickly. But if the, if they're you know sincere and intelligent and engaging and um, and you know fun, really, it's it, yeah. it, it, people that go into entrepreneurship. I I tell you, the day that I stop having fun is the day that I stop doing this. And right. um, so, you know, I, I, I tell people that when you're when you're in a business meeting, there's a, a very simple Jedi mind trick, which I always use that at the end of the meeting, whether or not it was a fun meeting, I say that was fun. And uh, and and, it, you know, it's important. It's important to have fun in business. It's important to solve real problems that have, um, you know, meaningful solutions in the real world. I mean, I would say something similar. I, I actually, uh, there are four things I look for in a company. I mentioned socially beneficial companies, companies that are impactful. Secondly, companies have validation. The fourth is um, companies that have a strong investment thesis. The third one, I, I, I'll, on this, you know, since it's a, a public forum, I'll just say people that I like. Um, but it really means I only want to work with people who, you know, and I won't use any foul language, but I actually use foul language to describe. I don't want to work with certain kinds of people. And there are two characteristics of people who are like that. Um, I want to only work with people who I can invite home for dinner and people I can trust with a handshake. And life is, as you, as you point out, life is just too short to waste with anybody else. I only work on referrals. Uh, occasionally I'll reach out to a company that I think is interesting just because they have some very interesting technology. Uh, so I only work with referrals and that way I get a good idea of the people that I'm working with. Uh, it can get difficult at times. So you really get into the trenches and everybody needs to keep their sense of humor about what they're working on and to be able to work uh, productively. Um, also, it's important that people live by their word. So these are things that are important about having referrals and uh, doing some investigation of who people are, uh, in, who by nature, who they are. I actually do spend a lot of time with people finding out, who, trying to find out who they are. Um, I don't really jump right into their investment pitch. Many people don't have that yet. Uh, I'm trying to get to know them better, try to figure out what, this, what they're trying to solve. Uh, a lot of them do, however, uh, fortunately do have investment pitches. Um, so, you know, that's sent to me ahead of time. I generally have a reasonably good idea of what they're trying to accomplish. But then I'm trying to evaluate, are these the kind of people who can actually um, uh, execute? Uh, along? Can they execute? And there are a lot of really nice people, and, uh, but they can't execute. Uh, and you have to kind of say, well, this is probably not going to work. 
Um, so anyway, I, I have a slightly different approach than you do, Bill, but I would agree with you. Life is too short. You only want to work with, with good people. I think that's good advice for just about anybody yeah. in business. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, I think Bill and I would agree. There's a lot of, you know, I'm, I actually am a registered investment banker. I am licensed uh, and I've operated as an investment banker. And I, you know, at the risk of insulting any investment bankers on here, uh, they're not, they don't get quite as much abuse as lawyers do, but um, investment bankers are very mercenary. And a lot of them will take on business any kind of business with any, any kind of people. And throughout the years, there have been many examples of people uh, working with uh, really low quality people who are, have done things that have been uh, pretty bad. And unfortunately, that's why the Securities and Exchange Commission exists to prevent us from getting involved in those kinds of bad actors. So uh, it, it, while it's good advice, a lot of people ignore it. And uh, as a result, uh, the industry can get a bad reputation. That makes sense. Um, just to jump in here, uh, for everybody that's attending, if you do have a question for Bill or Mitchell, please put it in the Q&A or in the chat, and we'll get to that uh, shortly <clears throat> as we get through the last couple of questions that we have on the agenda. Um, so one question that I do have is, you know, it sounds like you guys are trying to find, uh, you know, get companies ready to, or to get them VC ready, but then also go help, you know, find them some, some funders. What, uh, what do you think makes a good fit between a founder and a funder? Like, what are you guys looking for? So, I mean, listen, I, I, I think it's very important that the VCs have a clear investment thesis. And, um, and I think it's my responsibility to make sure that I know what the, the VC's investment thesis is. And a lot, again, in, in my space, for the most part, I've seen a lot of successes of the VCs and what tends to happen with VCs when they gain success is they move upstream, which means you know that they, they, they used to do um, funding for, for seed companies, but now they only do series A and above, or they used to do series A, but now they only do B and C. And, and there's very good reasons for that. Um, as you build a track record, you're able to attract more money. Um, so it's important to maintain the relationships with the VCs. And I think, th I think the VCs are, are generally speaking appreciative of people like myself that spend some time with the early entrepreneurs. And when they get a warm introduction from somebody like me to a VC, they generally know that it's going to be a pretty good fit for them. Now, um, and, and generally I can, I can outline a company to a VC within a, a couple of minutes to understand if there's a competitive company in their, in their portfolio so, so that they don't waste their time. And so I, I do think that a, a lot of, a lot of the, the value that I offer is through the time saving uh, and, and matching, really, it's, it's, it's matching, it's dating, it's, it's making sure that you partner the right companies with the right VCs that have the right ap appetite at the right time. You know, and I, I know there's certain VCs that are more interested in, in co like commercial real estate as opposed to residential real estate, et cetera. There's certain VCs that are open to hearing blockchain concepts. Others aren't. Um, and there's, uh, there's a bunch of different nuances in there. But um, yeah, I, I think it's important just to understand that the, the VCs, first of all, have, have an understandable and have communicated effectively their thesis that's important and then i can i can i can meet them where they want to be okay awesome yeah, you, you know question. neil yeah that was that's a pretty good question you know i i gotta say that i'm not so selective with the the the, the capital that's coming in uh because my my feeling is that the investor they're doing a lot of due diligence they're not putting money to work in any company that they uh, they think is a bad match or bad fit. You know, we try to present it to them in a way, uh, try to present companies to them in a way that appeals uh, to their interest. But I, I can't get into it as well as they do. And, and frankly, their investment thesis changes. You know, I, I don't think I'm as focused as you are, Bill, um, in a couple of industries as you are. I mean, I'm more, I'm more broad because I'm looking at impactful companies. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time on clean tech, energy, sustainability. I would say 80% of the 
companies I work with are in that area. Uh, I'm a mentor and entrepreneur in residence for about five incubators, uh, most notably New York State Energy Research Development Agency. Um, but um, so I, I do tend to focus on that. But even if you think about clean tech energy sustainability, there might be some companies that are only interested in ag tech and sustainability, but not interested in, in clean tech companies. And it's really, I, I think it's really hard to keep track of that uh, because there's so many. And it just seems like there are more and more every day. Uh, they just seem to be under the woodwork and popping up. Um, anything, you know, hence the reason for this conversation, Neil, you wanted, uh, the thought is that there might be some people who are interested in raising funds themselves. So on the capital side, I'm not so, I can't be so clear about it. I, we try to be intelligent about it, uh, but we don't know them uh, that well, to be honest. Uh, on the entrepreneurial side, since we do know the space as well, uh, I can figure out pretty well whether or not there's a lot of competition, whether or not it's a real problem. Uh, and that's important. Um, some problems, uh, you know, and whether or not with the, the amount of time it takes to, to solve that problem, who the customer is, and whether or not what they're talking about is going to appeal to institutional investors. That's important. I mean, they may not present, any, present it in a particularly good way, but that's part of what we're trying to accomplish is to help them um, position, position themselves better. And so I've got to try to ascertain whether or not uh, that's possible. So those are on the two sides of what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect them. Yeah, I, got, I also have a couple other thoughts here. Um, so, so a lot of the work that I do is, is pre-revenue and pre-seed, and, and that's a difficult space. So, um, and, and a couple of different companies, you know, I'm, I'm outside of the, of the prop tech area when I'm advising here. I've got an, an ed tech company that I'm working with. I'm also starting to look at military tech and, and some general tech as well. But um, one of the things that that I want to I want to make a statement here. Um, there there used to be this term that's used called friends and family round, and I can't state this enough that I that I hate this concept. Um, and and I recommend to all entrepreneurs that you do not do this under any circumstances. Um, you never do a friends and family round. Um, and and one of the rules of thumb here that I say is that. This, this, this term should be replaced by a term called the, the industry round. And so my point being is if you're going to talk to somebody about funding a super early stage company um, because you have a great idea and you have a great team and you're the one to execute it on, you should only be speaking to people that already understand the problem that you're trying to solve. If you have to explain to them what the problem you're trying to solve is, then you're talking to the wrong person. And there's a couple different reasons for this, but making sure that you have early clients, people that can help you with the product feedback loop, that can guide the, the product development is incredibly important at these early stages. And people that understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish is really important. And if you put them on your cap table, then it's going to be palatable for the future um, you know, uh, institutional financiers that, that are gonna come at later stages. So th that's just a, a thought I wanted to get out there. Awesome. That's a, I mean, that's interesting, though. You got an interesting perspective on that, right? So, you know, I think that's, that is, I kind of, I think that is a misnomer to call this a friends and family round because you have to wonder, do you really want to take money from your friends and family? You don't. Right. You don't really want to be doing that in the first place. Uh, so I, you know, you don't want to call it a, uh, I, my you point know, is acquaintances you should, you should, round. Right. I, I think, I think my point is you should never do that. And and there you because you, you can lose relationships doing it, and they're also not helpful. They don't they don't fully understand what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And on top of that, if you can't explain this to people in your industry, then you need to go back and get a job and and continue working your, to build up your own capital. You're not quite ready yet. And that, mm -hmm. that and I've got very strong opinions on that. Any any entrepreneur that comes to me saying they're going to raise money from their dad, I'm I'm done. That's it. Oh, their their dad could be a multi billionaire. Then it's all in that story. case. They're not coming and talking to me. They're, they're already, not coming to talk to you in the first place. That's, that's right. right. They're already yeah. out there. They're already out there with their project, probably failing. So yeah, 
I mean, at the end, at the end of the day, everybody's got to recognize that whatever their um, uh, venture is, it's it's highly risky. Almost all uh, almost all uh, entrepreneurial form companies fail, and even the best ones, and even after they've been funded, are are likely to fail. Um, and people forget that. And not only do they, and there are many reasons why a company can fail. Sometimes it's just purely luck. Uh, you know, if you're a travel technology company in January 2019, you're, you're, you know, you're out of luck. I mean, that was the end of it. You know, COVID pretty much did the, did away with that business. Uh, so the luck would be just that you didn't, you're not, that nothing bad happened to you at the wrong time. Um, so going to friends and families, I, I, I agree with you. It, it should be very, you should be very cautious and recognize uh, who's able to invest in your company. I would agree with you about that 100%. Uh, I, I do, however, think though, uh, on the other side that um, it should, shouldn't be related to industry. I, I actually feel that uh, you should be able to explain what you do quickly to people outside of the industry. And uh, also sometimes there are, uh, problems that are very difficult for anybody to understand. And, you know, we can give good examples of that, like like uh, uh, Google, for example. I mean, I can recall Google being pitched around, talked to by people. People just couldn't understand what is this? You know, why do we need to organize the World Wide Web? Why is that so important? And many people wouldn't really have understood that at all, uh, even people in the, in, in the industry. So it had to be explained well. So uh, I think, I, I kind of agree with you about that, Bill, not completely. I, I think that's our challenge is to be able to help people explain well enough that anybody could understand it. I mean, you know, I, that's, that's, that's my perspective about yeah, it. Yeah, and again, I, I'm only talking about pre-seed rounds, okay? Once okay. it gets beyond that, then it's different. All right, yes, yeah, so I would agree with you about that, right? I, I, I've never really, I don't really work with companies at that stage. I'm not usually. Maybe okay. that's worth talking a little bit about, Neil. I mean, there are companies, that, that's right, just as Bill said, a pre-seed round is kind of a company. It's kind of a start, you know, it's a concept stage. Um, and as Bill also pointed out, the the kind of, um, I guess, uh, tiers uh, that at which people characterize a, a stage has changed. A series A used to be any first institutional round. Uh, that might be a seed round or a series A. And it's kind of less uh, clear what those are, what those mean now. Uh, okay. But certainly for us, we're talking about companies that are doing they're doing pre-seed, seed, uh, or um, or a Series A. I mean, I think that's what we're talking about here for sure. Do you guys want to give a quick overview of what those different uh, different series uh, mean and what that means for investors? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. You can do I, it, Bill. So <laughs> yeah, listen, I, I think it, to me, it's pretty easy, right? I, I say any any company that's pre-revenue is pre-seed, right? Straight out. If, if you're at revenue, you're a seed company. And, and um, you know, if you, if you are doing a Series A, you better be ready for explosive growth. <laughs> okay, like, so, um, and so that means you've got significant revenues. And and you're really ready to to add fuel to the fire, and you're ready to uh, you're ready to expand out nationwide, or or, or really take a, a next big step. And and again, like so, when when I, I'll say this, <clears throat> so I when I'm advising my entrepreneurs, I make a point to say that when you raise money, it is not cause for celebration. Period. Um, raising money is simply an excellent opportunity for you to destroy your reputation. That's it. Once you've taken somebody else's money, you have major responsibilities and you have to take those incredibly seriously. So um, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That is, uh, th those are my thoughts on it. And those are the stages that I'm looking at. I, I would agree with you. I don't know if it's necessarily a cause of celebration when you get the capital. It means, you know, I guess that means you can start paying yourself. But other than that, uh, the, 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 the level of stress increases because the, the, there's a higher grade, there's more people counting on you to be successful. So there's more stress. 
So I would agree with you. It's not a cause for celebration. The cause of celebration is when the company finally is making a profit. Yeah, or you That's get a big thing. client. I mean, you get celebrate, big celebrate client, exactly. You, yeah, celebrate when you big, get a big client. Celebrate when you make a big sale. Celebrate. You know, there's plenty of times to celebrate. Raising money is not one of those times. Right. I, I I've stopped talking about what's a Series A or seed. I, I call it a first institutional round uh, because it's become very unclear. So. Um, but in general, I agree with Bill about what he's saying. Awesome. We got a bunch of questions from people. Yeah, that, you guys good if we move in on to the Q and A? Sure. All right, great. So um, this one comes from one of our really good friends at the Queen's Chamber, uh, Ben Gutman. Um, he asks, what's the most exciting space that you guys are looking at in 2022 and beyond? So for me, it's, it's I'm blockchain. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm, <coughs> I'm a I'm a full believer in blockchain technology, and uh, I believe it's going to it's going to be integrated into almost every industry that there is. Um, I'm heavily invested in it. I've made a bunch of money in it, um, and I, I'm looking for for all different ways I can integrate blockchain into the real world. You know, it'd probably be worth it. You know, Bill. I mean, I understand it, but I, maybe not everybody here understands the distinction between blockchain and cryptocurrency. Yeah, listen, I, I mean, that's that's a much longer conversation, actually, we probably could do just a panel mm -hmm. on that alone. So, if, if you know, I'll, I'll just say if people want to have a conversation about the difference between blockchain and crypto, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, you know, uh, it's a uh, there 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 are some significant differences and there, there's plenty of cryptocurrencies that I would advise people to stay very far away from. Um, I am looking at the technology for its functionality, um, but I do believe that there are entire virtual economies that are going to become very real. So Ben asked, uh, what's the most exciting space? And, and it just because just it's, I'll just say it only because it's kind of humorous to say a space, which is not really an area that I cover. But I will tell you that there's a big investment thesis for companies investing in space. Um, uh, SpaceX is not the only company out there. There are a lot of little ones also. Uh, for me, the most exciting areas, I think, are uh, what, what I focus on are uh, it, really, frankly, anything in clean tech is exciting to me right now. Uh, I've been involved in clean tech for a long time, and it's taken a long, there was a, uh, there was a time where people were investing in clean tech in the early 2000s or late, mid 2000s did not work out well and it's taken 15 years for people to get really excited about it again. Um, we're getting a, we have an extremely cooperative administration putting a lot of money into this space. Uh, New York State in particular is really ahead of the curve, New York City even more so. There are a lot of local regulations that are encouraging uh, energy efficiency and new technologies. Uh, energy storage is also gonna become uh, more significant alternative fuels. Uh, all these are very, very interesting opportunities for me. And, and, I, and I see this as continuing to grow. There's been a lot of that uh, currently uh, or in the last two years already. Awesome. Next question comes from Joe Labello. Uh, this one's for Bill. What's the hottest side of real estate in New York City right now, commercial or residential? <laughs> Oh boy! I mean, listen. I, I'm go. I'm going to. I'm going to give him an answer that he's not going to like. I mean, it, this New York City real estate, unfortunately, has become so massively political um, that it's it, it's it's insanely confusing to me. Um, there's uh, obviously warehouse space is the most important right now. That's certainly the hottest. Where people are trying to figure out ways that they can get you the goods in the last mile. Um, that's incredibly important. The, the, the residential space is, is always going to be, you know, solid, no question about it. I think com commercial is, is going through some very difficult problems right now when in the office side, I'm saying specifically, um, you know, and, and people are moving to buildings with more amenities because why, if you're just going to be in a, a normal office space, why don't you just stay home, which I think is really important. And, and retail is going through um, you know, some, some very difficult situations, but I, I think the government ultimately is hell bent on, on destroying entire segments of our, our, um, our economy, including restaurants. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm very disturbed by things that are going on at that level. 
I mean, look, real estate is all facets of real estate are interesting. And, and that's really my answer. I, I love it all. I, I, I'm interested in all parts of it. I, I just wish people would start using data more effectively. And, um, you know, we, we're, we've got a bunch of money coming into New York City through the EDC and, and through the federal government. We're going to need to deploy that money to retrofit buildings. Um, I, my, my hope is that we have leaders that actually understand data and how to deploy that money in an effective way. But ultimately, do I believe that's going to happen? Absolutely not. Um, you know, if we don't get a grasp on our, our city streets and the safety of people walking down the streets, then nobody's going to want to come back and nobody's going to want to live here. That directly impacts the value of our properties, which directly impacts the taxes. Um, I could go on and on forever about this. I, I, but, you know, I love it all. Love it all. All right. Great question and great answer. Um, all right. Next question we have here is from Mo Lu. Um, so if you, where could the money come from if there isn't enough funds of your own and you guys suggest you don't rely on families and uh, family members and friends at the beginning? Yeah. So, so again, like, you know, and I, I, I'm happy to have this conversation one-on-one, -on -one, but my first question is in what industry are you working? Right? Like, Number and, and here's another question that I ask: Who stands to benefit the most by the existence of your company? Okay, answer that question. Who is the beneficiary of your existence? If there is nobody that's a beneficiary of your existence, you don't have a business. And if you, if the answer is well, there's an entire list of people who are the beneficiaries of my existence. Then create a list, start at the top, work your way through the bottom. And by the time you get to the bottom, you are going to know a ton. And that's the work you need to do. It's a lot of footwork. It's a lot of fun. You better like people, be engaging, and be excited about your industry and how you're going to participate and integrate yourself into the industry. So there's, there's endless sums of money out there to access for good teams with good ideas that are going to do good things in this world. I would, you know, I'm not working with uh, earlier stage companies, but my experience is, is that companies that are concept oriented, they typically try to, they're getting money from uh, grants, uh, particularly they're solving some real problems. There are a lot of federal grant, uh, federal organizations they can go after to get grants. Uh, the other thing that I would suggest is go talk to accelerators, uh, incubators. They'll usually, uh, of course, they'll take a piece of the company uh, you can get some amount of capital, get started that way. Uh, all these incubators and accelerators will help uh, an entrepreneur build out his uh, most viable product and basic thesis about what they're trying to accomplish. So this is a good way to get started. And once you get this, let's say, uh, bona fide of, a, of uh, an accelerator incubator, then, you know, maybe then you can go back out to talk to your to your acquaintances or your network of people to, to invest. But um, that's a good place to get started. Uh, obviously, um, uh, one's own money, there's sweat equity. Uh, certainly, uh, it's possible to find some uh, benefactors who find the space particularly interesting, just as Bill pointed out, and reach out that way. Uh, but typically, I would suggest grants and accelerators are a good way to get started. Awesome. Great advice. And thank you for the question, Mo. Um, moving on, we have a question or two questions from Elizabeth Halliday. Um, Mitchell, she asks, um, for your fee and equity position, do you seek a controlling interest or a minority position? And do you ever seek a managerial role in the companies that you work with? Uh, that's a, you know, that's a good, good question. I've always said, I call that a gig, you know, when you work full time. Um, I've yet to pull the trigger on that. Bro. Uh, I've yet to come across an entity where I said, this is so great uh, that I'm going to devote all my time to that. Um, uh, but typically, the amount of equity that Strategic Ventures takes is a, is a small, very small minority of, of, of the company. Uh, typically, it's between 2 and 10%. And the, the way our, we're structured is that vests over a period of time. So it's not awarded out front and they're always, it's awarded always in warrants, like an option. Got it. And Bill, um, she asked a question of you, um, do you, for you uh, and your fees, do you take a fee or a piece of the project as well? 
I, I don't take any fees. Um, I'm too early stage to take any entrepreneur's cash. I would never do that. Um, you know, it, it's, it, you know, generally speaking, if I like the entrepreneur, if I like the project, I work for free. Um, and, you know, when, when it gets time to raise, m most of the time, the majority of the time, people ask me to join the advisory board and, and I'll take, you know, half a percent or a percent, um, depending. And, and, you know, people have asked me to join the companies and, and I have joined the companies. Um, so sometimes I'm like, you know what, I, I got to get in here and to, to move this thing to the next level. That has certainly happened. Um, and, uh, you know, again, like, so when, when I, when I work with a company, I, I, tr I ask myself, can I not just, can I provide value? Can I provide extreme value? And if the answer is yes, then, then I'm, you know, I'm, I feel pretty confident that I'm going to end up, you know, affiliated with that company one way or the other. Fantastic. So that actually brings us to the end of our questions. Um, before we sign off here, uh, Mitchell, or Bill, do you guys have anything else you'd like to share with our viewers? No, I listen. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something that Bill pointed up before. I think you know when someone says they're going to be an entrepreneur, you kind of wonder if you should uh, congratulate them or. Uh, you know, do you really congratulate a person to be doing that? I mean, that's a big uh, step before anybody to take. Being an entrepreneur is a lot of work and it can become uh, actually completely consuming uh, that everything else in one's life just goes by the side. So think very carefully about becoming an entrepreneur before doing so. Uh, it's a lot of work and it's, uh, it can be stressful and, but also rewarding. Yeah, listen, I, I want to reiterate that. I mean, you know, I, I would say if, if you're thinking about an entrepreneur and your, your only driver is money, don't do it. Go work for a bank or, or go do something else. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't consider myself to be a rich person. I consider myself to have a rich life. I mean, I, have, I, I am an extreme risk taker and I, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So I, I think it's, it's super important um, that you... Uh, that you focus, that you're passionate about the solutions that you're trying to, the brain, the hard work that you're trying to bring to the world. And that, that is, there's real passion there. And I think it's the most fulfilling lifestyle. And um, I, I would wish that, you know, all people would, would try entrepreneurship at, at some point in their life, in their career. And uh, besides that, I mean, people are free to reach out to me anytime through LinkedIn um you know bill stanford and and uh, you know generally speaking i'm happy to take introductory calls with with any honest and sincere entrepreneur fantastic and for the person asking about uh, the ability to rewatch this uh we will have uh, just reach out to me at n wagner at queenschamber.org um we should have a a recording of this up on our youtube page or something sometime soon so um but Thank you guys so much, Bill, Mitchell. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your experience with everybody here. And on behalf of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce and the Queen's Tech Council, thank you to everybody for attending. We really appreciate you taking the time. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. All, right. All the best. Take care. See you guys.